Batman. Happy Little Games. Add-ons that expand the scope of video game consoles are nothing new. Some of these go all the way back to 1982 with the original Intellivision and its Intellivoice voice synthesis module which utilizes a voice synthesizer to generate speech. There is also the Sega Scope 3D glasses for the Sega Master System, the 64 Double D expansion for the Nintendo 64, and yes, even backup units that were for <clears throat> development purposes. Today, we are taking a look at one of the add-ons which was one of the more notable missteps from the video game giants at Sega. The expansion in question is the Sega 32X. In this video, we will take a look at the creation of this ill-conceived add-on, as well as some of the best and worst titles released for the system. So sit back and enjoy the ride as we go back in time when Genesis was what Nintendo wasn't. This is the history of the Sega 32X. In the mid-1980s, Nintendo had positioned itself as the world leader in video game consoles with an amazing 90% of the market share. Atari and Sega were left with the other 10%, but by the early 1990s, all of that was about to change. NEC had released its PC engine system in Japan in 1987, which was a huge success selling over 5 million units in that country alone. Sega had released its powerful 16-bit console originally in 1988 in Japan and this was leaps and bounds ahead of what the NES could do. Nintendo would finally release its 16-bit successor, the Super Famicom, in Japan in 1990. Sega and Nintendo would become neck and neck with conflicting reports of how many units were sold. Thanks to some groundbreaking ideas by newly appointed Tom Kalinske, such as marketing towards teens and college students, dropping the price of the Genesis, and replacing Altered Beast with Sonic the Hedgehog as the pack in title, Sega was able to increase their market share from 8% to a whopping 55%. I'm sure Nintendo were none too pleased with this occurrence. The cool new wave of the future was CD-ROM technology thanks to its increased storage size with all three companies looking at producing add-ons for each of its consoles. NEC was the first to market with its add-on which came out all the way back in 1988. Sega's CD add-on was released in 1992 and featured an upgraded 12.5 MHz processor which runs 5 MHz faster than the Genesis. It did offer a few new tricks such as the ability to handle scaling and rotation similar to Mode 7 on the Super Nintendo. What it didn't do was increase the resolution or the colors on the screen which you noticed after 5 minutes of playing your very first full motion video title. After watching Dana Plato get chased around by aliens, you soon realized that while the full motion video was cool, it was too much of a herky-jerky, murky mess to be enjoyable. The Super Nintendo CD-ROM attachment, while highly publicized, never materialized. The Sega CD was considered a moderate success, selling over 2 million units, but consumers were not very happy at spending $300 for an add-on that was used primarily to play full motion video titles. Worldwide, 221 titles were produced for the Sega CD, but most of these didn't take full advantage of the add-on's capability. Nintendo and Sega would continue to duke it out in 1993, while Atari released its quote-unquote 64-bit Jaguar system and the 3DO interactive multiplayer was also released that same year, which consumers were starting to take notice of. 
It was around this time that Nintendo had entered into a partnership with Silicon Graphics to develop Project Reality, which would eventually turn into the Nintendo 64. Sega knew they had to do something and do it quick. At the January Consumer Electronics Show in 1994, the president of Sega Japan, Hayao Nakayama, made a frantic call to Joe Miller, who was the head of Sega of America R&D. Sega had its own next generation piece of hardware in the work, which would ultimately turn out to be the 32-bit Sega Saturn. Mr. Nakayama was concerned that the Saturn wouldn't be released in 1994 and felt they needed something on store shelves for fear of losing their market share. There was also something about the Atari Jaguar that put a quiver in Mr. Nakayama's liver so he felt it was best to get something to market as quickly as possible. The Japanese team thought that the best way to go was to release a new system known as Project Jupiter and then internally as the Genesis 2. Project Jupiter was initially slated to be an upgraded version of the Genesis with an improved color palette and at a lower price point than the 32-bit Saturn. It was also going to include some limited 3D capabilities thanks to the integration from the development of the Sega Virtua Processor chip. Mr. Miller dismissed this idea almost immediately. The first immediate problem was creating a brand new system from scratch within that time frame was almost impossible. According to Mr. Miller, it was just a horrible idea. If all you're going to do is enhance the system, you should make it an add-on. If it's a new system with legitimate new software, great. But if the only thing it does is double the colors, Mr. Miller wanted users to keep on using their existing Sega Genesis so they wouldn't alienate their customer base, not only by discarding their Genesis systems and games, but also discarding loads and loads of cash. At this point, Project Jupiter was discontinued and a new project was created by the name of Project Mars. Mr. Miller and his team at Sega of America would design the system which would be an add-on for the existing Genesis unit, but expanding the power with two 32-bit SH CPUs, which was similar to what was found in the Saturn but at a lower clock speed. According to Sega of America producer Scott Bayless, Marty Franz began designing the add-on using a hotel notepad drawing two SH2 processors. Despite it being an add-on and not a brand new system, development on the system and the games was severely limited. Due to a shortage of processors thanks to the same ones being used in both the 32X and the Saturn, certain games were hamstrung from the beginning. For example, producer John Branstetter was in charge of one of the key launch titles for the 32X, Star Wars Arcade, and didn't have anything positive to say. According to Mr. Branstetter, This was a Model 1 arcade game, but nothing could be ported over. Everything had to be done from scratch. We had six months, 24 hours a day, which is what I had to do to push my team to do it from start to finish. This was in addition to having to deal with buggy development units. I had to travel to Japan many times to get development kits because the hardware was very flaky and broke often. Our team leader went to meetings in Japan in May of 1994 and he got us a couple of development systems. Those were beige metal boxes about the size of a bar fridge half filled with electronics. One got shaken up too much in shipping and didn't work at all. Mr. Brandstetter wasn't kidding about the mini fridge containing electronics as you can see from these photos. While Sega promised 12 games for launch, only three made it out the door with the hardware. The hardware, even up to the last minute, was in a state of flux as most games only used one CPU due to cost savings bickering in Japan. It was also a bit too difficult to program the second CPU. 
Something that certain developers clearly took advantage of was the expanded color palette of the add-on which offered a palette of 32,000 colors as opposed to the 512 found in the standard Genesis. With these colors they were able to make among other things more realistic mud. Regardless of having the most photorealistic muck on any console, consumers just weren't taken with the product. The Sega Saturn was announced for a November 1994 release date in Japan, which was the exact same target for the 32X in North America. The 32X was considered a transitional device between the Genesis and the Saturn, but Mr. Bayless has said that just made Sega look greedy and dumb to consumers. The system made its target release window when it was released late in 1994 in all regions. The introductory price was $159.99 and was often seen as the poor man's entry into next generation gaming. It was promoted by Sega as a less expensive alternative to the Sega Saturn. Things were looking good as initially over 1 million pre-orders were placed but only around 665,000 were sold by the end of 1994. Only a handful of titles were available including some spectacular conversions of Virtual Racing and Star Wars Arcade but we also had some less than stellar conversions such as Doom which I will get to in just a moment. In total, only 40 games were produced for the system, but if you were lucky enough to have a Sega CD, you could combine that add-on with your shiny new 32X and play a truly fantastic version of Night Trap. Although the Saturn release was the main focus for Sega in 1995, they announced another planet-inspired system by the name of Neptune, which was a Genesis model with integrated 32X hardware. The suggested retail price was $149.99, which is crazy because six months prior, just the add-on itself was selling for that same price. This unit actually got pretty far along into development before it was cancelled. Despite the 32X having some good software titles, it was considered obsolete almost immediately upon its release thanks to the upcoming Saturn. Needless to say, the system was a huge failure and another black eye for the company. Developers were not too keen to jump on board so the full potential of the add-on was never achieved. In late 1995, Mr. Nakayama would cancel all Sega consoles except for the Saturn, which was a boneheaded move considering there were 30 million systems sold worldwide. The 32X was deeply discounted with the system selling for under $30 and games for under $20. Of the 40 titles that were released worldwide, we have some really good titles, some really stinky titles, and then we have some right in the middle. Certain games that were also released on the Genesis might have featured a few more colors on screen with the 32X, but usually the gameplay was identical. I'm going to go through some of these in no particular order, although I'm sure you'll be able to figure out which ones I really didn't care for. Since the beginning of time, mankind has striven to double and redouble his powers. A mysterious machine has appeared in homes across America. All right, baby. Increase the power of the unit 40 times. 32. X. Welcome to the next life. Can you spill your drink? I don't have a drink. Uh-oh. The first game we are checking out is the rather fantastic Virtua Fighter. This is spectacular from the smoothly animated character models to the nice, tight, responsive controls. The graphics are not quite as clean as the Sega Saturn version, but if you can believe it, the controls actually feel a bit snappier in this version. Since this is an early arcade conversion, there are no extras, so everything is unlocked and ready to go out of the box. 
This is awesome, and if you are a fan of Virtua Fighter, you should check it out. Any game that features a big, bald-headed, cheesesteak-eating human on the cover is a must-play for me. Tough Man Contest is a pure 100% punch-out knockoff, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. Punch-Out was a fantastic boxing game and still one of my favorites of all time. For those of you who don't know, the Tough Man Contest was popular in the early 90s before the boom period of MMA, which saw anyone with the testicular fortitude don a pair of gloves and give it a go inside the squared circle for a little bit of cash. You take control of your boxer as he battles through the ranks until finally coming face to face with the big man himself, Butterbean. You have different boxers to choose from, although they play pretty much the same. You have a number of punches to use, but you also get to assign three special punches for your character. The game only uses the standard Genesis 3 button pad, so unfortunately, you have to use a number of combinations on your controller similar to Street Fighter. There is a quick replay mode of the last combo that was used, which was a neat feature back in 1995. If you can get used to the controls, this game is a lot of fun to play and there is even a two-player mode. The game was also released for the Sega Genesis, which, for some reason, features better animated backgrounds than what we see in the 32X version. WWF Raw for the 32X is pretty much the same as its Genesis counterpart with redrawn backgrounds and a bit more color. The roster features 13 of your favorite wrestlers such as Luna Vachon, Lex Luger, and the 123 Kid. Other wrestlers you may have heard of are included as well such as The Undertaker and Bret Hart. The announcers at ringside also change from match to match. Sometimes it's Jim Ross and Jerry the King Lawler, and other times it's Gorilla Monsoon and someone I can't identify. If you know who it is, comment down below. The gameplay is identical to its 16-bit counterpart, which has definitely not aged well in my opinion. Everyone plays pretty much the same, which is not a good thing. This time around though, we do get one unlockable character. Now you would think they would have included someone with a little bit of prestige, such as Iron Mike Sharp or Mantar, but no, we get the one and only Quang. I would have rather played as his manager, Harvey Whippleman. If you were one of the lucky few to own a Sega Genesis, a Sega CD, and a 32X, then don't worry, Sega has got you covered. If you couldn't get enough of women in peril being chased by aliens but wanted a larger screen to see everything in, the 32X is what you need. This is basically the same as the Sega CD version, only with a larger screen, including better resolution and colors, allowing you to finally, potentially, maybe, see the outline of a nipple. The $500 I spent for this Sega smorgasbord would have bought a whole lot more if I would have just went to Reno instead. Listen, think.
Things are getting really weird around here. Keep your eyes open and watch out for the other girls. Although it received mixed reviews in the gaming magazines at the time, I really enjoyed Tempo, especially back in the day. The presentation reminds me of a trippy 1970s acid-induced cartoon with its generous use of colors and nicely animated backgrounds. You take control of a little guy by the name of Tempo as he tries to reach the major minor show which is a dance contest. However, the scheming King Dirge wants the trophy for himself and has placed his subordinates all throughout the levels in an attempt to stop Tempo. This is a fun little platform game with some spectacular graphics and smooth animation. It's not all peaches and cream though because the backgrounds are animated so well that sometimes enemy objects get lost within them, making for a frustrating gaming experience. The music is excellent with plenty of toe-tapping tunes to accompany your journey. The game does offer branching paths, giving it a little bit more replay value. The controls are a bit stiff, but overall, I really enjoyed this title. In the mid-90s, Doom was a smash success on computers all across the world. While it wasn't the first first-person shooter, it was, however, a fantastic game and also helped get youngsters started in the art of Satanism. There have been some bad ports of Doom over the years, especially for the Super Nintendo, but the 32X version is right up there as one of the worst. Most of the levels are cut down with seven of them missing completely. We also don't get full screen action thanks to a border around the screen. Even with this border, the graphics are still a bit blurry, especially when there is a whole lot of shooting going on. Also, the BFG, which is clearly listed in the manual as being available, is nowhere to be found unless you use a cheat to get it. The music is not very good, so it fits in perfectly with the rest of the presentation. The game supports the six button pad, but strafe is mapped to a single button that you have to hold, which doesn't work very well. Afterburner Complete was released for the system and it is spectacular. Although it only runs at 30 frames per second, it still gets the job done and it's very similar to the arcade game. It is very cool to have an almost arcade perfect version at home, but when you're showing off your newly fangled $160 add-on in 1994, converting an arcade game from 1987 shouldn't be that difficult. With that being said, it plays great and the music is good as well. Sticking with Sega arcade conversions, I might as well mention Space Harrier, which is awesome. While not exactly arcade perfect, it does a great job at replicating the arcade visuals and it plays great.
Cosmic Carnage looks like any other fighting game, but this time it was built from the ground up to take advantage of the Sega 32X hardware. This is a standard one-on-one -on -one fighter in which you have your choice of eight different creatures from around the galaxy, duking it out to see who is the best of the best. The gameplay is a mixture of Street Fighter 2 and Mortal Kombat with a little bit of that zooming effect found in SNK's Art of Fighting and Samurai Showdown. You have a variety of moves at your disposal thanks to the six button pad. You also have special moves and finishing moves similar to fatalities. You can also customize your character giving them armor which gives you additional moves. The armor can also be broken off during battle. On the surface, this looks like a fun little game, but the controls are not very good. There is a lot of slowdown at various points throughout the game. The music, and in particular, the sound effects are a bit dire. Now I'm not saying that the quality of the game is as bad as Rise of the Robots, but it's also not the best of the best, which would have to be brutal above the claw. It's actually somewhere in the middle. A nice little treat for those that do enjoy this game is that there are multiple endings depending on how quick you can beat the game. It's sad to say, but the game is so limited that with a few small tweaks here and there, it could have appeared on the Sega Genesis. If you've ever wondered what it was like to soar the friendly skies, shooting laser beams out of your eyeballs, and occasionally getting down and dirty with flowers of all shapes and sizes, then you definitely need to try out Colibri. This is a one or two player game in which you take on the role of a hummingbird going from level to level in an effort to save planet Earth. Don't let the story get in the way because that's not what we're here for. The first thing you notice upon firing up this gem of a game is the fantastic presentation. The pixel art is fantastic with a ton of color and nicely detailed graphics. You'll get a chance to really soak in the graphics because there are 20 levels in total. Your hummingbird has a number of different powers including the aforementioned eyeball laser beams, extra energy, shields, and even slow motion flying whenever you fly over a large slow mo pod. Life pods can be released by drinking the sweet, sweet nectar that you'll find scattered throughout the game. The game has a nice style of play and it does remind me a little bit of Echo the Dolphin with some Shadow of the Beast on the Amiga thrown in. One of my favorite early 1990s racers was Virtua Racing. Thanks to a little help from the Sega Virtua processor chip, we got a pretty good conversion for the Sega Genesis, although all that extra technology helped jack up the price close to $100. Right out of the gate, we received a version for the 32X which was titled Virtua Racing Deluxe and it makes the Sega Genesis version look like a pile of puke. Okay, maybe not, but the difference in graphic quality is pretty significant. The animation is much smoother in this version and everything has a nice, crisp look to it which mimics the arcade game quite nicely. This game offers two new vehicles, the stock car and the prototype car, with each one having different driving mechanics. There is also a time attack mode, a two-player split-screen mode, and more. 
Sega have given us two new tracks as well, so there are now five to race around. The music and the sound effects are really good, with the announcer shouting time bonus after every checkpoint. Next to the arcade original, this is my favorite version of virtual racing to play. Star Wars Arcade was another launch title for the 32X, which, surprise surprise, is the one and only conversion of the Model 1 arcade game. The gameplay is reminiscent of the original 1983 Atari classic, but this time you can pilot either an X-Wing or a Y-Wing in an attempt to thwart the evil empire. To this day, it is such a cool feeling flying down the trench of the Death Star, shooting turrets and taking out TIE Fighters. In addition to the obligatory trench runs, there are also dogfights and other missions for you to complete. The graphics feature nice 3D polygons, but there has been a dramatic drop in quality from the arcade original. For starters, while the arcade game runs at 60 frames per second, this game struggles to get to 30 and sometimes drops down to 20. When I first played this version back in the day, I was impressed with the visuals, but now that I'm a spoiled, rotten child of emulation, it doesn't hold up that well. At various intervals throughout the game, there are cinematics which was a nice showcase for the Model 1 hardware. The 32X version does feature most of these, although they are scaled back. There are two modes of play which include the Arcade and the 32X. The 32X mode offers longer, more challenging levels. For any Star Wars game, the music has to be perfect and the 32X version does a good job at presenting John Williams' original score. The controls are pretty good in this version, although nothing beats using the actual flight stick from the arcade game. My favorites for the system, which was a 32X exclusive, was Spider-Man Web of Fire. Despite the lackluster choice of Hydra as the main antagonist instead of Dr. Octopus or the Green Goblin, the game sees Spider-Man swinging all over New York City taking out the various bad guys. This is a typical side-scrolling beat-em-up, but the animation and web shooting are top-notch. You can choose to pummel your opponent using your proportionate strength of a spider or simply web them up. The speed of the game is fast and smooth and the music is catchy with lots of rhythmic beats to go along with all that punching. This was one of the last titles released for the system and it commands a very high price with boxed copies selling for close to $2,000. And that brings an end to the history and the games of the 32X. This add-on always fascinated me, especially with Sega's early promises of 32-bit gaming at a reasonable price. It's too bad more developers weren't brought on board, such as Capcom, because I would have loved to have seen what they could have done with the system. There were a lot of titles left off this list, so if you would like me to do another part, let me know in the comments down below. If you like this video, be sure to like, comment, share, and subscribe. Also, if you would like to support me on Patreon, please click the link below. If you would like to contribute but not sign up for my Patreon, you can always click the donate button up above. Thanks everyone for watching.